Hello everybody, welcome back. Today we're doing another Strengths and Materials problem. And today we're going to be looking at stress again, specifically normal stress. And we're going to be relating it to something we covered before, which is actually the analysis of trusses. Uh, and the question goes as follows. We have a pin-connected truss, which is loaded and supported as shown below. We're asked to determine the normal stress in member CD, which is this one right here, if it has a cross-sectional area of 624 millimeters squared. And then the second question is the minimum cross-sectional area uh, is asked to be determined for member DF if the normal stress for that member is limited to 25 MPA. So the problem is giving us a lot of variables right off the rip. So we should probably look in to see what we actually need to know before hopping into each part. So for part A, we know that it's asking for normal stress in the member CD. So what's normal stress again? Normal stress is represented by the force uh, perpendicular to the cross-sectional area. And we know in part A that we're given the area of the member, uh, which is 624 millimeters squared. So we know that normal stress is going to equal to P over 624 millimeters squared. But what's P? Well, if we're looking at member CD, we can identify that the force that's referring to is going to be that internal force within the member. So that leaves us with a final formula for normal force at CD, which is going to equal to FCD over 624 millimeters squared. So what type of methods uh, are available for us to solve this type of problem? Well, we can look at section method uh, and consider a uh, cut something like this. However, due to the complex geometry, uh, and knowing that we need to solve for CD and DF for both parts of this problem, uh, section method just really isn't viable based on the geometry of uh, the truss. However, we do have another method, which is the joint method, uh, which is going to be a lot simpler in our case, where we have joint E, which we can look at. So why joint E if we need to look at CD and DF? Why am I starting here? Well, I can tell from the geometry of the truss that we have two members at this joint. So if we have two members, one member has one X component and no Y component, and the second member has a Y and an X component. So if we actually analyze a joint E, we can first solve for this Y component to get the magnitude of the force within this member to solve for the next member, DE, which can then be transferred over to the next joint to get all of those other important members. So let's start with part A look into that joint E and see what we're dealing with. All right, so now that everything's set up, we have the free body diagram of joint E so that we can analyze for these simple forces and then carry those over into the joint D so that we can get the forces we're actually looking for, which are FCD and FDF. Now, I've also brought over this convention from a previous video, which is just showing you uh, the tension and compression forces within the truss and how to understand what's what uh, based on the arrows and the way they're pointing uh, in the free body system. So let's start with joint E. We have written down that we have a 10 kilonewton external force. We have DE, which is going to be pulling away from that joint. And then we have FFE pointing upwards to resist that 10 kilonewton force. And there's two different ways that you can go about getting the components for this force. You can recognize that we have a 3, 4, 5 triangle, as we have a 3 meter here and a 4 meter here, composing that 3, 4, 5. Or we could also take uh, theta about this point here or about this point here, and then use Z pattern to get that angle. So that would just be tan inverse of 4 over 3. But we have the special triangle, so we can just proceed as follows. We know that we have only one unknown Y, so it would be wise to start with summation of Y equals 0. And we're going to be looking at 0, which is equal to negative 10, which is that external force pointing down. And then we're going to be adding the Y component of the F, F E, which is going to be 4 over 5. Solving for that, the signs are going to work out, and we're going to be left with 12.5 kilonewtons. And that's going to be in compression because it's pushing towards the joint. And then we can move on to get Fx equal to 0, so that we can solve for that x component in Fde. So we have 0, which is going to be negative Fde. And now we consider the x component of Ffe, which is going to be positive Ffe. 3 over 5 now, since we want that x component here. 
positive, obviously, because we have a convention like this for x and like this for y. And we know FFE is 12.5. So plugging that in and solving for FD, we are left with 7.5 kilonewtons, and that's going to be intention. All right, now we can carry over that FDE component that we calculated before, which is 7.5 kilonewtons. Uh, we can move on to joint D, and we can take a look at what FDC is and FDF is so that we can solve A and B respectively. The first thing we need to do is figure out what this data is, because FDC has components Y and components X. And as we can see on this diagram, we know the height corresponding to this member CD, uh, but we don't know the base or the length that we need to use in order to determine that data. So we can use similar triangles based on the entire geometry of the truss structure in order to create a relationship between this theta and this theta. So we don't know this x value, which is here, but we do know the height of this, uh, this opposite uh, side to the angle, which is going to be 2 meters. We also know that this angle here, which is parallel to the joint, is following the same line of action as this member at the bottom here. So that means these angles are going to be the same. So if we consider the base of this angle and the height that it's corresponding to, we actually have 3 meters plus 3 meters, which is going to be 6 on the bottom. And then we have 2 plus 2 plus 2, which is going to be 6 on the side. Now, relating these together, we know that 6 over 6 is going to be equivalent to x over 2. Therefore, x will equal 2 meters. And then we can use that information to solve for the angle theta, which will be the tan inverse of 2 over 2, which will simply be equal to 45 degrees. Now we can get to the fun part and start solving for the components. We know that we have only one x component to solve for, but there are two y components. So we're going to start with f at x, which is equal to 0. And we're going to be looking at an equation that looks something like this we have the negative F, uh, FDC component, which is going to be the cosine of 45. And then we're going to be adding that FDE that we found earlier. Solving for that, we're left with FDC, which is equal to 9.86 kilonewtons in tension. And then we can do the same for summation of forces at Y. We're going to have 0, which is equal to negative 12 minus 9.86, which we just solved for the sine of 45. And we're going to be adding that component FDF, since it's positive in this direction. Looking at FDF and isolating for it, we're going to be left with 18.4 kilonewtons. And now we have the forces of both the members that we need for A and B. So let's proceed to part A and solve, and let's proceed to part B after. All right, so now we can finally get solving. We have all the variables we need to solve part A finally. So we know the normal stress is going to equal to FCD over the area given. So that is simply going to be 9.86 times 10 to the 3 newtons over 624 millimeters squared. Why did I do times 10 to the 3, though? I converted it because we know that MPA which is megapascals, will be newtons over millimeters squared. So it's just a simple conversion uh, in order to avoid any confusion during solving. We like to keep all of our stresses in a consistent unit, and MPA tends to be that unit. So solving this, we're left with the normal force created in CD based on the area is equal to 15.8 MPA. Final answer one. Now for part B. We're going to take the same concept. We're looking for the minimal cross-sectional area for, remember, df if the normal stress is limited. So we have the normal stress formula, but now we're going to be looking at df. If we're looking at df, that means we have to consider the force at df over the area. But now area is unknown. So we have to isolate for area, which is going to be the minimum, which is equal to the force at df over the normal stress in df. Now, solving this formula, we just need to plug in the values that we solved for previously. So we have 18.4 times 10 to the 3 newtons. 
and we're going to have the restriction, which is 25 MPa, so 25, and that's newtons per millimeter squared. Our newtons will cancel out, the millimeters will be brought to the top, and we'll be left with the final answer for area minimum, which is 736 millimeters. And that's your second final answer.